A dramatic fall from grace. Malaysia's former leader scrambles to make bail after being arrested on corruption charges. Is the new government cleaning up or taking revenge? I'm Imran Garda and today's newsmaker is Najib Razak. Just a few short months ago, he was Malaysia's prime minister. Now, Najib Razak could spend two decades behind bars. He's accused of laundering billions of dollars from a state fund that he founded himself. It's an allegation that has haunted him for some time. But since he lost May's election to Mahathir Mohamed, it all seems to be catching up with him. Najib has always denied any wrongdoing and says the new government is out for political revenge. So is Mahathir really cracking down on corruption or simply taking out an old friend turned foe? That debate in a moment. But first, here's Christine Provalakis. The Wolf of Wall Street, the hit Hollywood film about a stockbroker who scammed investors out of millions of dollars, was allegedly financed with stolen money. Was all this legal? Absolutely not. Former Malaysian Prime Minister Najib Razak is accused of being the man behind that cash. Now he risks spending the rest of his life behind bars. Najib has been charged in an investigation into how billions of dollars of taxpayers' money went missing from 1MDB, a state development fund he founded. The money was apparently used to buy luxury properties and yachts, finance films and acquire art from around the world. Najib has pleaded not guilty to corruption and breach of trust and faces up to 20 years in prison. The bank accounts of his family have been frozen. They posted part of his bail and his supporters collected donations for the rest. What I hope is that the judicial process is a process that is truly fair, following the rule of law. I'm confident in my innocence. This is the best chance to clear my name. Najib was Malaysia's prime minister until two months ago. And his surprising election defeat prevented him from blocking further 1MDB investigations. The country's new leader, Mohatir Mohamed, had promised to prosecute crooked politicians if elected. And now it looks like he's made good on his word. I'm glad that we finally can see some justice being served against uh, our corrupt uh, leaders. Um, but at the same time, I think this is just the beginning. I'm not really sure um, why the current governments of the day are uh, doing this to him. Uh, if he is uh, guilty, let the court decide. One MDB was set up by Najib in 2009 and was promoted to Malaysians as a way to attract foreign investment and development in the country. But six years later, it was missing payments to banks and bondholders. Subsequent investigations found at least $4 billion had been pumped out of the fund, including $730 million that U.S. prosecutors say ended up in Najib's personal accounts. Money from the fund is believed to have passed through the U.S., Singapore and Switzerland, which are just a few of the countries investigating the case. When Najib was in power, his government refused to cooperate with foreign prosecutors on 1MDB. He's also been accused of controlling Malaysia's courts as well as its media. Political rivals and critics who challenged him, like opposition leader Anwar Ibrahim, ended up in prison. Najib is the first to face trial in the 1MDB scandal, and many hope his arrest is a step forward for justice in Malaysia, where corruption has seemed commonplace in the highest ranks of government. Christine Pidovolakis, The Newsmakers. Well, joining me now from Kuala Lumpur is Charles Santiago. He's a member of parliament for the ruling Democratic Action Party. And we also have from Singapore, Mohamed Nawab, Mohamed Osman. He's the coordinator of Malaysia program at the S. Rajaratnam School of International Studies. Gentlemen, thanks for joining us. Nawab Osman, let me begin with you. Is the arrest of Najib justified? Now, I think that, uh, you know, there is a case to be made that essentially uh, there has been some misuse of uh, funds. There has been some mismanagement of the 1MDB uh, company. 
Uh, and clearly, uh, you know, there, there has been a lot of... Uh, the economy has been affected as a result of this uh, issue. We've had an outflow of capital uh, since the 1MDB scandal uh, broke out. And uh, as such, I think it, it is justified. Now, having said that, I think we need to qualify as well that this is just the beginning of this probe. And, uh, you know, just like the 1MDB, I think there are many other corruption scandals and issues that would need to be dealt with. Uh, some actually perpetrated by uh, basically people associated with the current Prime Minister, Dr. Mahathir, and how that's going to pan out would be, uh, you know, important to see. Charles Santiago, tell me why this isn't just victors, justice and political persecution. <laughs> that's an interesting way of putting it, though. Uh, I think uh, just to respond to uh, Nawab's uh, uh, issue that he had raised, uh, the government of Malaysia actually is um, charging the former prime minister under anti-money laundering uh, act, anti-terrorism financing, and proceeds of unlawful activities. Uh, I think what is key here is money laundering. Uh, and I think money laundering has been going on through the 1MDB for quite some time. And it is time to bring the biggest culprit uh, uh, to own up. And I think that is the reason behind this particular uh, case. And also to, to make it worse for, to, to, make up, to, to make it worse for the prime, former prime minister, the police raided his house and went back home with 1.1 billion ringgit of cash, uh, jewelry, designer handbags, uh, other, other luxury items. So this is just not any kind of a probe. This is really a huge uh, probe, which also led to uh, freezing of 408 uh, bank accounts right. invo or involving 81 individuals and 55 companies. So what you see is a pattern, a pattern of laundering of uh, the people's money. And I think it's fair that the government of Malaysia uh, goes after these people and brings them to court. Okay, well, joining the conversation from Kuala Lumpur is O.I. Sun. He is Najib Razak's former political secretary and now an advisor on international affairs at the Asia Strategy and Leadership Institute. O.I. Sun, good to have you on the program again. The last time I spoke to you on the program, you were defending then Prime Minister Najib Razak. Do you have any regrets? Do you feel that you, I don't know, maybe backed the wrong horse? No, I don't think I was defending him. I think I was uh, laying out the political reality uh, on the ground. At that point, Najib Razak uh, was uh, in a position to control all the machineries of state. It is uh, very uh, difficult uh, to imagine at that point. And I think the same go, uh, went with a lot of political analysts that uh, he could uh, willingly relinquish uh, his grip on uh, power. And now that uh, it is over, Malaysia has turned a new chapter. Right. And given that this is a twin-pronged attack against him, you have the U.S. Justice Department's probe involving $731 million. And then you have the Malaysian one, which was, of course, they looked at a, a local offshoot of the, the Sovereign Wealth Fund so that they could go after him locally. You have this twin-pronged attack. Do you feel, oh, I assume, that it's going to be very difficult for Najib Razak to stay out of jail? Well, the U.S. Uh, uh, sort of uh, lines of charges uh, have been around for, I think, at least uh, two years. Uh, so far, it's a civil uh, suit, but I think very soon uh, there will be some uh, criminal prosecution being pursued from the uh, U.S. side. On the uh, Malaysian perspective, the, they are focusing on uh, the uh, subsidiary of uh, 1MDB. Uh, I think in the coming months, uh, the Malaysian government has a very uh, uh, inevitable uh, task, namely on the one hand to vigorously uh, pursue the prosecution, and on the other hand, not to be seen as pursuing some sort of political persecution. That is why the new government, I think it's uh, uh, taking extra care in terms of framing the charges. They are not framing uh, sort of uh, big charges against him, but uh, on, uh, on charges that uh, they felt that they have uh, sufficient evidence. Right. Yeah. Nawab Osman, are his due process rights being respected? 
No, I think that uh, when we look at uh, the processes, I think this government has uh, done its uh, due uh, checks uh, in terms of how things are to be done. Uh, I think the way uh, the Attorney General has uh, laid out the case is also, um, you know, fair. I think it follows, uh, you know, the standard legal procedures that have been laid out uh, within the country. Uh, and they did not uh, immediately charge uh, Najib Razak uh, right after the election. I think they got down to trying to understand the uh, problem, uh, the magnitude of the problem and the repercussions of it. And then finally, uh, they charged him under the Money Laundering mm -hmm. Act. So I think uh, due process have taken place. Charles Santiago, he has pleaded not guilty. What do you think the possibilities are of the fact that perhaps it was going on, but he didn't quite know about it. He was too busy running the country. Well, it's not possible to, uh, to uh, undertake such a huge uh, undertaking involving many countries, a, a, a huge number of banks uh, by one person. And, and, uh, and his signature, according to the present prime minister, is all over the place, which means that he had given permission uh, he had given, he had signed on to the movement of money, the laundering of money, I should say, from one bank to the other, or more specifically, from the Malaysian uh, uh, Bank Negara, Federal Reserve Bank, to other countries. Uh, so his signature is all over the place. So you cannot now say that uh, somebody else was responsible for it. He has to uh, take responsibility for it. Oh, I soon. What are his options? If you were still advising him, what are his options? How does he try to fight this and maybe get off? Well, he has basically two causes of uh, action. I strongly suspect the cause of action to, that he's pursuing now is very akin to what Anwar Ibrahim was pursuing to, well 20 years ago and also in the past few years, namely to claim uh, political persecution. But this case is very di uh, different from the Anwar case. In the Anwar case, there's a widespread perception that Anwar Ibrahim was framed, uh, it was political persecution. But in the present case, I think there's, uh, there's exactly the opposite. There's a uh, popular uh, demand for even more uh, rigorous uh, and high-level uh, pr prosecution, not persecution, of uh, Mr. Najib. Uh, so if I were still advising him at the moment, I would advise him to uh, sort of uh, lie low and not uh, openly criticize the new government and so, so that, uh, for example, the even more serious charges wouldn't be coming his way. You know? no, yeah, Nawab Usman, is that wise advice? Well, I think that um, what we're seeing now, and it's not uh, very uh, unlike uh, what you would see from a leader from the United Malay National Organization, uh, is him playing up um, the issue of political persecution, but also playing up the issue of race. I think this is a very sensitive, uh, both issues of race and religion are of uh, you know, very sensitive nature in the case of Malaysia. And uh, he has come out basically talking about how the uh, Malay, uh, the political dominance of the Malay or the position of the Malay within their country as sons of the soil, as the term would be described, as he would describe the, uh, the Malays as, uh, it has been uh, impacted as a result of the new government coming in. So this is, in a way, a way for Najib to distract uh, him away, uh, distract uh, uh, the, the attention of the uh, largest uh, group of people, the Malays in the country, away from the corruption uh, scandal. And I think the perception in regards to the uh, scandal also differs depending on who you speak to. I mean, when I was carrying out field work during the election uh, campaign, uh, if you speak to the folks in the rural areas, uh, the issue of corruption is perhaps less of a concern with right. regards to them, uh, as far as they are concerned. I think it's more uh, issues of uh, standard of living and so on. Right. Charles Santiago, I'm glad that Owaisun brought up the Anwar Ibrahim case and he mentioned that there was a widespread belief that Anwar Ibrahim was being politically persecuted and he was being framed. Of course, the kind of dramatic twist when it comes to moving forward is that the man he accused of framing him, Mah Mahathir Mohamed, has tapped him up as future leader of the country. Now there's an unlikely alliance and a lot of forgiveness. You're in the corridors of power, Charles Santiago. 
What should we know about Malaysian politics given that those two men are now working together and both probably very happy that Najib Razak might be going to jail? Uh, Malaysian politics is very unpredictable. Uh, foes can become friends and friends can become foes. Uh, it's clearly quite unpredictable, predict predictable. But I think what you're looking here is the issue of principles. I think uh, both uh, Dr. Sri Anwar and Tun Mahade uh, feel that the country is going down the sewer, uh, is really uh, going backwards, and therefore there's a need to uh, do a U-turn, uh, need to bring back the uh, country that Malaysia was and could, have be, could be. So I think both, both of them realize that uh, one of the biggest problems that facing the country would be is corruption. Uh, and therefore, I think that that's one of the reasons why they actually uh, came together in order to take on uh, Najib, who was then the, the chief of uh, AMNO, the ruling party. Uh, I also think that um, the coming together of uh, 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 these two uh, personalities is a big thing in the Malay, pol in the Malay political world, where you have two uh, sworn enemies, uh, that is Najib, uh, that is Mahade and uh, Anwar. Uh, putting behind their differences uh, and saying, let's do something that is good for the country. Uh, and that, I think, uh, was able to, 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 to mobilize public opinion, public support towards supporting the uh, Pakatan Harapan. Oh, I soon. Does Najib have to go down as a symbol? Does he have to go to jail and does he have to be disgraced in order for Malaysia to have a clear victory over corruption, at least symbolically? Well, there's uh, obviously popular demand, huge popular thirst uh, to see, uh, for example, Najib and his cohorts of uh, people uh, to, who, who would take, take up responsibility for this uh, massive uh, misappropriation uh, of uh, funds. I also think it's rather difficult to racialize uh, uh, his uh, alleged uh, misdoings because uh, some of those also accused of uh, at least assisting him, uh, they are also of various uh, different uh, races, uh, including Chinese, for example. So uh, you, 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 you can't really like putting this uh, as, uh, you know, like one race against another type of uh, uh, operations. Yeah. Okay. Nawab Osman, you want to respond to that? Racializing, it doesn't quite check out? Oh, I think that, uh, yeah, I mean, in, in this particular case, yes. But I think, I mean, if I may address uh, Charles, uh, what, you know, Charles's uh, remark earlier about these two men coming to, together, mobilizing uh, sort of the Malay, polit the Malay political ground, not the Malaysian one, I don't quite agree because 70% of the Malay population did not vote for this government. And uh, this government got only 30-odd percent. Uh, for, so the vast majority of uh, Malays, it's not just a small majority, the vast majority did not vote for this government. So I think uh, while the, this particular case might not be uh, one where it could be racialized, I, I, I agree to, with Isan, uh, but I think the issues of religion and race would be very important features uh, or at least issue, uh, issues that we would have to look out for going forward, uh, you know, uh, we, you know, going forward in, in terms of Malaysians uh, political trajectory. And I think that uh, given right now that the overwhelming uh, majority of uh, Malays actually supported the current opposition, which is also overwhelmingly Malay, I think it would be interesting to see uh, how issues of race and religion uh, would be played out by the opposition. Okay, just as we wrap up, Charles Santiago, a very final response from you. 69% of people didn't vote for this government. So where's this unity that you're talking about? Uh, I think uh, what is significant to note is that uh, the 30% that actually voted or the 40% that actually voted for uh, Pakatan Harapan uh, did it for two reasons. One, because of high cost of living. Number two, corruption. Uh, again, is critical of uh, Najib. And more importantly, the unity between uh, Mahade as well as Anwar. So you needed the com a combination of things and one of that was the tie-up between uh, Najib uh, sorry, tie up between Anwar and uh, Mahade. Okay, well, let's find out what's going to happen to Najib Razak. We await the courts and we await those 
in the legal corridors of power. Uh, and of course, there is the separate case, as we mentioned, in the United States. Gentlemen, it's been fascinating talking about Malaysia with you, Charles Santiago, Owai Sun, and Mohammed Nawab, Mohammed Osman. Thank you very much for joining us here on the Newsmakers. Still to come on the newsmakers, who's behind a failed plan to bomb this rally of Iranian dissidents in France? And taxed for tweeting, Uganda introduces a new social media tariff. We ask if it's an attempt to silence dissent. Six people, including a diplomat, were detained over an alleged plot to bomb an Iranian opposition rally in Paris. The group, called the People's Mujahideen of Iran, or the MEK, were hosting their annual convention with thousands in attendance, including some close to the Trump administration. While the attack was foiled, it sparked further tension between these two bitter enemies. The MEK says the Iranian government was behind the attempted bombing, but Tehran considers them a terrorist group and says they orchestrated the plot themselves. So who is actually responsible? For more, here's Shoaib Hassan. Ladies and gentlemen. A suspected plot to bomb an Iranian opposition rally in Paris and the arrest of a diplomat based in Austria. A cloak and dagger series of events that could imperil Iran's international rehabilitation. Last week's events have strained ties between Iran and its remaining allies in the West. An Iranian diplomat was arrested in Germany, suspected of being involved in a scheme to bomb opposition protests by the Mujahideen-e Khalq, also known as the MEK. It happened just as Iranian President Hassan Rouhani arrived in Vienna. Wir haben auch die Möglichkeit gehabt, heute während unseres Gesprächs über den Fall des iranischen Diplomaten zu sprechen, der hier auch in den Medien in den letzten Tagen publik geworden ist. Wir erwarten uns in diesem Zusammenhang volle Aufklärung und ich darf mich auch bedanken, Herr Präsident, dass Sie uns zugesichert haben, diese Aufklärung zu unterstützen. It's a blow to Rouhani's efforts to strengthen EU ties and salvage the country's nuclear peace deal. US President Donald Trump pulled the plug on the deal in May this year, after it seemed set to bring relief to Tehran's economy, which had suffered under sanctions. It's already led to riots inside Iran, as opposition groups outside the country step up protests, calling for more sanctions, and an end to diplomatic engagement with the Islamic Republic. MEK are the most prominent among them. The MEK was founded in 1965 as a Marxist revolutionary organization seeking to overthrow the Shah of Iran. It was one of the two main components of the opposition movement that eventually overthrew Shah Raza Pehlavi in the 1979 Iranian revolution. The group's main ally was the Islamic movement led by Ayatollah Ruullah Khomeini. After the Shah's overthrow, the mujahideen e khalq refused to endorse a constitutional referendum validating the Islamic Republic. Khomeini ordered a crackdown on the group, but the main leaders, including party chief Masood Rajavi, fled abroad. The party now operates out of headquarters in France. A military wing of the group continues to operate within Iran and has been accused of having killed 10,000 people in attacks since 1979. It was regarded as a terrorist group by the UK until 2008, the EU until 2009, and by Canada and the United States until 2012. This change in status has allowed the group to increase protests in Western capitals and helped its most vocal supporters like US National Security Advisor John Bolton to lobby for greater sanctions against Tehran. But Iran's denied it was behind the latest bomb plot. It says the MEK orchestrated it themselves to damage Iran's image internationally. Is there some truth in the Iranian government's allegations? Or is this just another sign of rising frustration from a government struggling to deal with internal dissent? Shoaib Hassan, the newsmakers. Well, joining me now from Tehran is Iranian affairs analyst Said Mustafa Hoshcheshm. In Ballantry, Scotland, we have Struan Stevenson. He's a former member of the European Parliament, where he was the president of the Friends of a Free Iran 
Intergroup. He was at the conference hosted by the MEK in Paris. And with me here in the studio is journalist Borzo Daragahi. He's a contributor to foreign policy and the Atlantic, covering the Middle East and North Africa. Gentlemen, thanks so much for joining us here on the Newsmakers. Before I get into who done it or who tried to do it, I want to kind of lay a foundation in a little bit uh, with this discussion first. Borzo, let me start with you. Is MEK a terrorist group? I mean, I, I, I try, I, I'm a journalist. I try not to use that word. Mm. Uh, I would describe them as a um, potentially dangerous, mm -hmm. cult-like uh, organization that is extremely mendacious, uh, extremely uh, dishonest, um, and rather unliked by many, many, many Iranians. They do have their supporters in right. the diaspora and inside Iran. Um, I've seen them described as Iran's uh, Khmer Rouge. Mm -hmm. uh, I would not necessarily, as, as both a journalist and a, a, a kind of a, a Iranian uh, a American myself, I would not necessarily disagree with that assessment. Right. Okay, Said Mustafa Hoshchesham. Is MEK a terrorist organization? Well, sure. Um, you know, they were, uh, they, they started uh, their life a few years before the revolution through a blending of uh, Marxism and Islamism. but. They were never accepted by uh, religious leaders, including Iran's uh, revolution leader, former revolution leader Ayatollah uh, uh, Khomeini, because uh, uh, they embarked on armed struggle and terrorist operations that included the uh, civilian toll, and also they killed six Americans. Uh, Americans were uh, seen as enemies uh, those days before the revolution, of course, and after. But uh, uh, Imam Khomeini never accepted this group because uh, he believed that uh, terrorist operations are banned, and they uh, and he never uh, endorsed their operation. After the, the revolution, they started armed insurgency in Iran. They have killed 17,000 Iranian civilians and officials, including 72 parliament members, right. a president, a prime minister, head of the judiciary. And many normal citizens who just uh, because they looked like uh, fervent supporters of the Islamic Republic. Just one more sentence. On a single day when they lost the, the armed insurgency in order to create horror among the public, they were ordered to take out to the streets and kill anyone who looks like a supporter of the Islamic Republic. On that day, uh, at 2 o'clock p.m., they killed anyone that they saw who had grown beard mm -hmm. and wearing a mustache, and they killed uh, jobless people, students, teachers, green grocers, butchers, normal citizens. Hundreds of people were killed. There, is, there are some sites uh, that, that you, you may see uh, those sites, the names of the victims Understood. that have been killed okay. by this terrorist wanna... cult okay. in Iran. I, I and got it, uh, uh, they are sure a terrorist organization by every definition. Okay. And, and that's great. And my apologies for interrupting, but there is a delay as well. And I'm going to have to interrupt you from time to time. My apologies in advance. I want to keep this moving on. Struan Stevenson. So we've heard from both guests. On the one hand, you have Borzu not, not going so far as to say they are a terror group, but calling them mendacious, potentially dangerous, cult-like, dishonest. We have the view from Tehran. They've killed 17,000 civilians. They killed a prime minister. They killed a president. What on earth were you doing at their rally then? Yeah, you know, I've heard all these allegations before. The absurdity of saying things like they are almost like the Iranian version of the Khmer Rouge. You know, I really have to question the veracity of any journalist that could say such a thing. I've been supporting this organization for 15 years. I've met them many times before in the European Parliament in many different uh, fora around the world. Why do you think Thousands of parliamentarians, elected parliamentarians in Europe, many former prime ministers, many leaders, many former foreign ministers, people like Rudy Giuliani, Newt Gingrich. Why do you think we all support them? Is it because, because we know enemy of my enemy is my friend? We know, their, we know their honesty. We know they are genuine. We know they are being horribly oppressed and persecuted by the murderous medieval right. regime. Is it possible? Uh, yeah, just before we move on to the potential, the, the bomb plot, right? Let me ask you a very simple question. Is it because the enemy of my enemy is my friend? You don't like the Iranian regime. Yes, the Iranian regime does horrible things, but that doesn't mean you just support whoever stands up against them, right? The MEK crimes are a no, fact. It is because they are the main democratic opposition. They are led by a woman 
they are offering a 10-point manifesto that I myself, as a European, would be proud to mm -hmm. stand for election on their manifesto platform. And that, of course, is why uh, Khamenei and the Ayatollahs hate them. They hate the fact that they have an opposition movement led by a woman who are offering democracy, freedom and justice to the people of Iran. Okay, and good to get that, that perspective. Something that has been absent for 40 years. Okay, good to get that perspective. Now, Borzu, as I move this on a little bit, I'm going to ask you to fold in your response to Struan into the answer about whether they actually might have tried to bomb themselves as a false flag, as the Iranians say, mm -hmm. or the Iranian government might have tried to blow them up. Well, I, I mean, I, I, I really am, you know, not surprised. I know that the uh, MEK have their supporters abroad. Um, I'm not sure where this gentleman is coming from. I would never question uh, his integrity and mm -hmm. so on. I'm sure he's a true believer uh, for honest reasons. But many of the other supporters are paid. Uh, many of the people that he listed, you know, uh, you know, former Mayor Giuliani, um, they're paid to support the MEK. Um, and you know that's that's their decision to to advocate for this group. They get money for that. Um, as for the issue of this this alleged bomb plot, I mean it it it's not um, uh, out of line with what the the kinds of things that the regime has done in the past. Mm -hmm. Yes, in many respects, the MEK is a um, kind of irrelevant organization inside Iran, but they have done one thing that has gotten the ire of Iranian, the, the Iranian government, mm -hmm. and that is uh, their alleged participation in these plots to assassinate uh, Iranian nuclear scientists. Right. And you could see, uh, and, this, and we're, we're dealing in the realm of like sort of clandestine black ops and so on, there's no evidence to right. this effect, but you could see certain people inside the regime feeling like they need to respond to these assassinations. Right and feeling they need to make the um, MEK pay a price. And you know, in recent years, we've also seen a pattern of more and more adventurism right. on the part of the Iranian regime using diplomatic outposts as a tool to expand uh, their power and so on. You've seen, I, I've heard complaints from uh, former and, and current Iranian diplomats that IRGC folks are coming into their turf and taking over and so on. So one could imagine that uh, certain rogue elements in the Iranian it security might not have come from the top, right? Okay, so that's interesting. So Mustafa Hashem, I know that you and Borzu probably largely agree uh, when it comes to whether the MEK is an unhealthy uh, organization, but you're probably going to disagree on this. You mentioned a litany of crimes that the MEK committed and are alleged to have committed, and then we also see we have an MEP here and for a former MEP, we have, some, we, we have a bunch of people in the West who have been won over, seduced by MEK and supporting their cause. Doesn't that give the Iranian regime complete motive to, to crush them however they can? Because these guys not only did terrible things, but they're winning over all these Westerners. Doesn't that suggest that maybe the Iranian regime, or at least uh, some from within it, tried to do this rally harm? Well, I answer your question uh, uh, fast. Um, before that, I would like to raise a question for your friend, uh, 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 the uh, MP, uh, who's a fervent supporter of MKO. Maybe uh, he needs to present some explanations why the EU and uh, Britain uh, blacklisted, as well as the US, all blacklisted MKO, MEK, whatever they are called, they have hundreds of names, as a terrorist organization before 2011 and after 2011 and 2012, when Obama started and Hillary Clinton started, uh, you know, damaging Iran's reputation for justifying their sanctions and rallying international support for their sanctions against Iran, they uh, took them uh, off uh, the blacklist. But in response to your question, not that because I'm an Iranian, um, um, even many Iranians abroad that are opposition of the Islamic Republic, uh, monarchists, also the Marxists, communists, uh, seculars, anyone, uh, go ask them. Many of them detest this group and consider them as a terrorist organization. Now, a group that has lost thousands of members, its uh, uh, members have decreased from 20,000 to a few thousand. They are old. And even in that last gathering, you could see that half of the hall were, was, you know, filled with uh, some East European tourists who had come there as tourists for, you know, three-day stay in there in return for food and accommodation. They paid 
20 euros. And they were, uh, uh, these are the pictures that have been released by the Western Media Outlets, of course, uh, that they were lying at the end uh, rows of the hall. Uh, such a group that's useless, actually, and has proved, you know, uh, a full, you know, defeat for the Western policies. Why should Iran take the, uh, you know, risk to pay the costs for such an operation on the day that President Rouhani is in right. Europe uh, and is trying to save the nuclear deal? Is it uh, possible, Mr. Hoshashim, but Mr. Hoshashim, is it possible that within the government, uh -huh. maybe from the IRGC, I don't know, but is it possible that there might have been rogue elements who don't like the fact that President Rouhani wants to save the deal? They don't like the fact that Iran is engaging with the Europeans, and maybe they wanted to do something about it. Is that plausible? No, not at all. You could see that uh, when President Rouhani was in Europe, he said he, he issued a tacit warning saying that uh, Iran would do a number of things if it couldn't, uh, you know, export oil. Uh, right after that, top Iranian generals all supported this policy, not just this policy, but they said, and that's the statement. Uh, 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 the head of the IRGC, the commander-in-chief of the IRGC, and other top generals have stated that they support him in whatever policy that uh, he wants to adopt. Uh, on the other hand, Iran is an integrated government and ruling system. The Islamic Republic is not ruled by separate people. Uh, there, there is a ruling system in here. There are policies. Iran has not done that for sure. Why, sh when, uh, why should Iran embark on a terrorist operation like this when it has complied with all its duties and responsibilities uh, under the, the JCPOA, okay. the nuclear deal, and it's waiting for the Europeans uh, uh, to comply and to, uh, you know, uh, with their undertakings okay. and hold up their end of the bargain? Okay. Why Got should it. Iran... Uh, embark on such an operation that's all costs. Okay. Let me ask you, Mr. Stevenson, to respond to a tweet from Iran's foreign minister, Javad Zarif. He says, how convenient, just as we embark on a presidential visit to Europe, an alleged Iranian operation and its plotters arrested, Iran unequivocally condemns all violence and terror anywhere and is ready to work with all concerned to uncover what is a sinister false flag ploy. That's Iranian foreign minister, Javad Zarif. Struan Stevenson. Your response to that tweet is what? Well, first of all, uh, let me say to your uh, Turkish audience that uh, the Iranians have some uh, previous uh, record of this because Manashar Mataki, when he was the uh, Iranian ambassador to Turkey, he was actually expelled by the Turkish government in 1988 uh, when one of his embassy cars was stopped at the border and uh, a prisoner was found tied up in the trunk of the car, who then exposed the fact that he had been held with several other MEK prisoners in a dungeon underneath the Iranian embassy in Ankara, where they had been tortured, and admitted that they were being taken back for execution to Iran. So Mataki was expelled. And what did the Iranians do? They appointed him later as their foreign minister. Uh, a known murderer and a criminal became their foreign minister. Now, this is uh, par for the course with the Iranians because, of course, they have a long track record of uh, murdering their opponents in Turkey, in Europe and elsewhere. Bomb plots like the one that was attempted last week uh, where the, uh, the main culprit was a diplomat in the Vienna embassy uh, he, Mr. Assadi, is well known as the uh, MIS, the Ministry of Intelligence and Security from Iran, their uh, Austrian uh, chief, station chief. He, uh, now according to the federal prosecutor from Belgium, was known to have handed the explosives over to the two arrested terrorists in the car in right. Luxembourg. And, you know, this is unequivocal. It is evidence, not from me, not from a journalist, it's from the federal prosecutor. This is a terrorist regime, a gangster regime, who quite certainly go out, all out, to murder their, uh, right. their, their opposition. Okay. You, you know, yep. the, 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 I wouldn't put it past the MEK or whatever, MKO, whatever, PMOI, to uh, do something like this. They are also a pretty murderous organization. But uh, at this point, uh, when you look at the people who are making this allegation, these allegations mm. about the bomb plot, Austria, Belgium, France, 
Germany. These are the countries that are involved in this investigation, and they're making these allegations. They're putting this together. Mm. These are countries that have absolutely no incentive whatsoever mm. to stir up things with Iran like right now. Um, I think that they are, they're doing this despite what their political and foreign policy right. interests are. So I don't see this. Uh, it, it makes it very unlikely that this is a, right. a, 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 a false flag operation, so to speak. It's either a rogue operation, very, very possibly, um, or something that there was planned from the, the, right. the, uh, the regime. And so, Borzu, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. If, you know, if it's a false flag, you have to you know, really prove it beyond a shadow of a doubt. As you mentioned, the Austrians, the Belgians, the French, and the Germans, all at the moment, not directly, but looking into it, and the suggestion being that the Iranian government wanted to take out this rally. If that is the case, if there's proof that this came from Tehran, what would that mean for, for Iran and the Europeans? It makes it tougher for the Europeans to uphold the JCPOA and to make this thing work. Already there's a lot of disagreements about the nuclear deal uh, and Iranian, with Iranians saying that the proposal submitted by the Europeans is not enough, the Europeans saying maybe we can't do much better. Um, you know, if Iran wanted to uh, make this issue go away, it could do one thing is say, remove the diplomatic immunity of this, this mm. guy, Assadullah. And it has not done that. In fact, it has demanded that mm. he be uh, handed over and offered diplomatic immunity and allowed to depart from the EU. Uh, and that doesn't look good. It's not a good look for the Iranians. Right. Okay. So, very finally, Said Mustafa Hoshcheshim, if the Iranians are completely transparent about this, why not let justice take its course? If you trust the Germans, if you trust the Europeans, um, the Austrians, and so forth, Remove the diplomatic immunity of Assadullah uh, Assadi and let justice take its course. Why not? Okay. Uh, let me tell you. The Israelis say that they first fed the security officials in Europe with this plot. And we know that the Israelis are arch enemies of the Islamic Republic. In the last case, under the nuclear deal several years ago, the MKO and Israelis started some uh, so-called laptop documents. They presented it to the German authorities. Uh, German authorities have confessed in interviews with uh, uh, Garrett Porter, a very well-known investigative journalist who is American, by the way, uh, that at the first look that they had at this, uh, these documents, they laughed and they uh, gave it back to the MKO. A year later, they received the same documents from Americans and they never rejected. And they, that the, the head of the German security says uh, in that interview in the book that we were astonished how come our American counterparts have accepted this uh, to be genuine. But they built up on that uh, docu those uh, you know, alleged uh, documents and uh, presented the uh, uh, PMD or possible military dimension case uh, that was eventually resolved on the nuclear case that was, uh, you know, a, ch a bargaining chip. Uh, to receive concessions from Iran. But at the end of the day, uh, everyone confessed that Iran has not done any kind of such activities. You know, when they want to justify sanctions and pressures against Iran, this happened under Obama, they raised so many plots like this in order to damage Iran's reputation to justify their, uh, you know, pressures. Also, to increase the costs for anyone who wants to back up Iran on the uh, international scene, like okay. the Chinese and the Russians. Okay. And also, in order to blacklist the IRGC, Trump has long been trying to uh, blacklist them as a terrorist organization. Now he's paving the ground for that. Also, they are changing the picture of the MKO as a terrorist organization to the victim of terrorism right. through such allegations. One last I've thing. Got a rap. The last time yes, Obama please. did the same thing. They claimed that IRGC wanted to assassinate Adel al Jobag, the Saudi envo envoy, mm -hmm. but a after they ratified a UN General Assembly resolution that was non binding against Iran, they said that the only witness in that case was a mentally ill person and sent him to asylum. Okay. The case was dismissed Point completely, but a resolution, UN resolution against Iran, remained in place. Okay. So Mustafa, this is listen. completely a false flag operation, really... and the goals are clearly known. Okay, I really have to wrap now. Up. I know Strohan and Borzo are both chomping at the bit to jump in, but we're completely no. out of time now. No, I'd love okay. to. Actually, I'm good. Okay, you're good? Okay. <laughs> so, listen, we'll, we'll have you back on the show in the future, all of you, and I thank you for joining us. Borzo Strohan and Mustafa Oshchashim, thanks again for joining us here on The Newsmakers. From Facebook to Twitter, social media has become an everyday part of people's lives around the world. But in Uganda, using these platforms just got a little bit harder. 
At the start of this month, the government introduced a five cent daily tax on the use of social media. And Ugandans are far from impressed, saying the added cost is an attack on free speech. The measure was first proposed earlier this year by President Yoweri Museveni. He complained that social media was rife with gossip and urged his finance minister to deal with it. And in an ironic twist, the leader explained some of the other reasons behind the tax using, you guessed it, Twitter. So, is this a legitimate tariff or a way of curtailing dissent? To answer that, I'm joined from Kampala by Nicholas Opio. He's a lawyer and founder of the human rights organization Chapter 4 Uganda. Thanks so much for joining us. Nicholas, is this new law and this new tax as crazy as it sounds? Absolutely. It's extraordinarily uh, crazy, you know, because what they're doing on this tax is taxing people for using social media. Remember that people have paid taxes on the data that they use, on the airtime that they use, and they're being taxed a third time for simply accessing and using social media. In terms of taxing principles, it is not just double but triple taxation, but also taxing a service they don't provide. Because excise duty that is being levied for use of social media is a duty on products or services that you have provided. The government doesn't provide social media so taxing people for just using the platform is absolutely crazy. So why do you think they're doing this? This tax is a tax that comes on a backdrop of the president's express uneasiness with social media, which has become a very powerful tool for political organizing. Let's just flash back a bit and remember that on election day in Uganda in 2016, the government shut down social media. On the day that President Museveni was being sworn in, the president again shut down social media. The allegations at the time were that social media was being used to ferment insecurity. Consistently after that, government has been peddling a narrative that paints social media not as a, a good uh, instrument for development, but rather as a tool for organizing against government. Therefore, the express intended uh, purpose for leaving this tax is not about revenue collection. Rather, it's about a new tool for suppressing dissent. Social media has become a very powerful tool for organizing in this country, especially among the urban elite. Mm -hmm. So this tax is seen as a tax to limit access to and use of social media as a platform for organizing. Okay, so maybe their execution is wrong. Maybe what they're doing hasn't been fully thought through. But at the, at the core of it all, does Museveni have a point? And does the government have a point that what they call Lugambo or gossip has terrible consequences sometimes? That sometimes on social media, by the sharing of what can be called, say, fake news on Facebook and, and Twitter and even WhatsApp in these mass messages, it can cause a riot. People can die by people spreading malicious and fake information. Do they have a point at least with regards to that? They if they do have a point about it, then they don't make that point as expressly as you've made it. It is true that social media has been used in some cases for bad, for, I mean, for, for really, really, really bad intentions. People who have slandered other people, people who have spread false information. But to focus on that takes away attention from the massive benefit of new media. Remember that social media has been a space for young people to provide for employment. There are several people who have begun businesses whose module is around social media. There are people who are accessing critical information about health, about education, about the economy, about all sorts of things on social media. So whilst there are a few people on social media who may have been spreading hate messages, who have been spreading rumors, it should not dwarf the benefit of social media and how social media has been instrumental in providing employment, providing access to information. In many cases, even government institutions communicate messages on social media. So social media, like any other platform, is just a platform. The misuse of that platform is not different from the misuse of radio, the misuse of the wider web, or the misuse of mm -hmm. any forms of communication. So I think other than focus on the negativity the few incidents of negativity on social media, we should look at the greater good and benefit and harness that greater good and benefit. And if we do so, 
we have the ability to encourage a community of responsible users online. Yeah, and I understand. People who spread fa false news right. don't get much traction in the, in the long run. Right, and I understand that on Wednesday there's a national march against this law and this tax. It's going to be interesting to see what sort of numbers um, we have from people there. Very finally, so what are people doing right now? The law's in effect. This is happening. Service providers are uh, implementing this. Are people just using VPNs as a workaround? There are several people that I know, including myself, who have never paid a cent of that tax because there are other ways of going around the tax. We've used VPN. We've used other means to avoid the tax. There are other people who have gone to court to challenge uh, the tax and, and, and to make the point that the tax is really uh, an undue restriction on access to information and free expression. But there are also other people who have promised to go, to go on the street on Wednesday to protest this tax. I don't think that the police will allow them to do so. I, I reckon that they will be dispersed. They won't be allowed to express themselves. But I do think that uh, if they were allowed to express themselves, hundreds of people around the country would turn up for this demonstration. But more importantly, even the government itself has realized that this tax is causing a problem. We've had government ministers saying publicly that they're going to review and reflect on how this tax is being applied and how best they can resolve the question. On, on, on the question of mobile money, the president himself has pronounced that he has reduced the charges on use of mobile money to 0.5% right. from 1%. So clearly, this process of enacting the law was put up hurriedly without careful thought of the impact and its implication on the people. I think that government will go back to the drawing board. The Minister of Finance has promised to bring a law in Parliament to review the amendment. So I'm hopeful that the government will rethink this tax and, uh, and, uh, and scrap it all together uh, in, 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 in the coming months because the public outcry across the country, across ages, across the political divide has been against the tax. Nicholas Opio, great to talk to you here on The Newsmakers. Thank you very much for joining us. That's all for this edition of The Newsmakers with me, Imran Garda. Thank you for watching. Bye-bye.